do the raffle. Um, tonight, we have three great talks from Sea Grant Graduate Fellows and PICAST Graduate Scholars. PICAST is the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center. These are um, student researchers who are studying oceans and coasts. And in addition to their research, to the coursework that they complete for their degrees, they are also receiving training from Sea Grant and PICAST in science communication and stakeholder engagement. Um, after each of the talks tonight, we will take a question from the audience, a question or two. So um, keep those questions in mind. We definitely wanna hear them. Online audience, if you have a question, simply type them into the chat and we're gonna keep track of your questions that way. Um, okay, super excited to bring the first speaker to the stage. Her name is Cassie Ka'apu Lyons. Her talk is titled, Nourished by the Sea, What I Learned Exploring Larval Fish Diets. Give it up for Cassie. Thank you, Maya. So my name is Cassie. I'm a PhD student um, under Brian Bowen at HIMB. And um, I have been examining fish, larval fish diets. Uh, last year, I gave a talk here and I want to kind of just give an overview of um, what we talked about. And so I'm looking at larval fish, what larval fish eat in the wild. Um, and I address why this is important. And this is because majority of the fish that you see in the pet store, the marine fish at least, are wild caught. And so I'm using um, genetic technology to determine what's in the guts of these fish. And that's so that we can tailor a diet um, to those fish larvae so that we can grow them in captivity. But I don't wanna talk about any of that. I'm gonna talk about the process that it took to get there. And so there were a few challenges like finding fish larvae, um, working alone, and then streamlining the process so that we could easily identify fish larvae fairly quickly. Um, larval fish are very different from adult fish. And when you collect adult fish, you can look for the species that you want here. And then you can net it or spear, and then you have your fish that you, that you wanted. However, larval fish are really small and they're in the plankton. And so you're essentially flying blind. And so it's not a fish market. You can't go in and say, I want, 50 yellow tangs, or I want 50 butterfly fish. And so to give you kind of an idea of the process, there's this, it's not that short, it's kind of long, <laughs> video of us going out and collecting these fish larvae. And so uh, what I did was um, I sampled out in Kaneohe Bay um, at two sites within Kaneohe Bay. And um, this was a follow-up to a study that was done in the 70s. So I kind of did a side study on top of collecting larvae for the feeding study. And then we deploy the net. And so we sampled out here uh, three times a day, twice a month for two years almost. And so you have to get the net uh, tight and it's good. We're towing it at the surface for roughly 20 minutes. And then we start hauling it back in to see what we got. This, this is a one meter um, diameter plankton net. It's pretty heavy once you bring it up. And we want to try to wash all the larvae down and every, all the organisms that we catch. And so that's the cod end where the, um, everything is collected. And we put it into a bucket and then we wash it out. So what did we get? <laughs> we got plankton. And so these are all different kinds of um, organisms, invertebrates and vertebrates. And so I did a rough 
analysis of what what we got and or, originally i was hoping to get fish that people would want to put into their aquariums we don't get any fish that we people want to put in their aquariums we get a ton of blennies a ton of gobies and gobies are really hard to identify and then a lot of unknowns that we can't even we can't even identify with the keys and then a few um like ulua and uh anchovies and a few angel fishes and dragonets and stuff so again it's not a fish market you just get what you're you catch and you have to work with that so after we've collected this is me <laughs> during covid trying to analyze my samples and this is the hard part about not being in, I, I'm not in a larval fish lab, I'm in a genetics lab. And so um, I'm the only person who works on larval fish. And so um, in response to that, I got this really great call in 2021 from a PI at Leeward Community College. And he said, hey, I have these six students who are interested in doing research um, or getting some research experience. Do you, I heard you could use some help sorting and identifying your fish larvae. Do you think we could create a collaboration there? And it's worked out fantastically. Um, we have an ongoing research program that provides these students with a stipend, a mentorship, and some research experience. And um, a lot of what they did was sorting for fish, like looking for fish larvae. So this is what a toe looks like. And you can see there's like inverts and lots and lots of inverts. And then right here in the middle is a larval fish. And so this is kind of in real time, what it looks like, what they're looking at. Um, and they're goofy, they like to dress up a lot. <laughs> so there's only one normal photo in here of them. Um, so now they're pulling, we're, we're isolating the fish from the rest of what's in that toe and they, put it aside. And so when they put it aside, these boxes here are all the toes, mostly, with all individual fishes like in these little vials down here. And to assist them in identifying, we created this data sheet. And so they had to fill out all these data sheets for each individual fish. And these are the end product. <laughs> the data, 14 binders, some of them are not included here, of just these individual identification sheets. And if you still don't believe me that they've done a lot of work, here is a graph of the semesters that the students have worked with the number of students per each semester and the total number of hours cumulative. So as of this semester, the students have worked 12,500 work hours. <laughs> Thanks, Micah. <laughs> to assist them with this pro process, uh, we had a whole bunch of keys. And so it's really helpful if we have something that helps guide our identifications, like a menu. And so we had a ton of different types of keys. We had this Indo-Pacific coastal fishes and the, um, that helps get to family. Um, we have these two um, more Hawaii-based uh, keys that have a lot of pictures um, to help us with the Hawaii fishes. This down here was a bunch of sheets that were put on, um, on a board in the classroom, and they just have the family names and then a generalized picture of that those fish families. And that was the most common um, way that the students would at least start out. Uh, because they would take a picture of what was in their microscope and then um, take it up to the board and try to match body shape with the fishes here. Um, and then the last one was Bruce Mundy, who is a wonderful um, taxonom taxonomic expert with larval fish. And he created this monster book of little monsters. Um, but what I found is in general, because we all had, all these things were separate, Students tend to go towards the easiest one um, to help them identify the fish larvae. So I created 
an interactive identification guide. And what it does is it asks you different questions, like what is the body type? And you could select on different options and it would advance it. And then you can go back and if you got it wrong. So say we're looking at a dorsal ventrally flattened fish, we could click this button right here and it would take us to those pictures. And then you could say, okay, my fish looks like this calianimid. And then these are pictures that we've taken in the lab to help you identify as well as a generalized um, guide. And then if you have more questions, you can go and it kind of takes you to that monster book. And so that seems to be really helpful for the students. So um, moving forward, to go back to the issues, we had difficulty finding larvae, but we found species that we can work with. So for example, we have a, a native um, blenny and an invasive blenny that I'm going to look at the, and compare diets to. We also were able to conduct an ichthyoplankton study and we can make comparisons to the 1950s. Um, for working alone, we now have an ongoing research family at LCC, and this is not limited to me. This is to anyone who has research and is looking for um, a great bunch of students to help them with their research. And they've already been working with agencies like NOAA to work through their larval fish toes. They've also started a long-term ecological study at Pu'uloa, which is um, adding on to what I did in Kaneohe Bay. And then they've also done work with Sumida Farms and some work with Red Hill. And then we have this larval fish identification guide, which is a work in progress. Um, and it will continue to be a work in progress in, as we collect more data. And it, what, it seemed to work well with streamlining, um, teaching multiple students how to identify fish larvae, as well as myself, because I was learning through this whole process as well. Um, right now it's focused on Hawaii, but it hopefully will uh, be expanded to the Pacific. So again, there's no normal photos. Um, a huge thank you because I could not have done this without, and I'm gonna take a little bit of time on this, without all these people. Um, you know, I started this project and uh, one of the PIs who had done this previously, he was like, you might want to like reduce it a little bit. And I was like, nah, we'll just keep it as it is. <laughs> and I, I learned that um, without a huge army, I you couldn't do this. So, um, oops, sorry. To all the Tobo lab, um, the plankton crew kind of started out at HPU and then moved to LCC and then tons of collaborators that help. Um, sorry, I keep trying to do the red button um, that helped me identify fish and help me with uh, the genetics. And then to my funding sources for NSF, CTSA, and then C grant. And this is, <laughs> this is the plankton crew at Leeward Community College, at least a few of them. Um, they really like to dress up for the holidays and always having a holiday party. Um, and so it really has become kind of a family. And then, thank you for listening. And then I just wanted to point out real quickly that all these pictures, um, I don't know if you noticed on that little data sheet, there was a place for the students to draw. These are their photo, their, these are their uh, illustrations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, the plan is, I have, Let's give another big round of applause for Kat. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take off the Q&A, okay. which I heard from the audience. When can we buy the t-shirt with the larval fish? After I make my dissertation dress. <laughs> okay, so after the dissertation dress coming in the next couple months. Uh, next year. Next. Stay tuned. <laughs> Questions for Cassie? Yes. George. Yeah. What did you do with the, all the unknown, unknown species? 
Um, and let's I'm, repeat the question for our online. Oh, okay. I guess I have that. Um, the question was, what are we? What did I do with all the unknown species? Um, so the next part of this, the next part of this project, thank you, <laughs> um, is to do some community genetics. And so I am eventually going to run them and try to figure out what they are, but using genetics instead of taxonomic identification. Yes. Um, the question was, uh, what kind of patterns were have I been seeing with um, what the data that I've collected compared to the data from the 70s? Um, it's a little preliminary to say, um, but some of the things I've noticed was like we're getting a lot less fish than when than we were seeing in the 70s. And um, I have some theories as to why. Um, but I also collected eggs, which I didn't talk about, and I've counted and counted the eggs, and the eggs are more than what they've collected in the 70s, but the fish are less. And so um, I'm still going to give that some thought and try to finish. We're pretty much done, but I want to get to a point where I've analyzed the data and give it a little more thought. <laughs> yes. Very cool talk, Nancy. Thank you. Um, also love all the artwork, not just the level finish. That was so cool. Uh, but I was wondering if you see different patterns of the species makeup, um, if you were to show at different times of the day or at different um, periods of the month. Different periods of the month, like, like new moon versus. Um, OK, so the question was, do we see different species composition, depending on the time of the day or the period of the month. Um, what I can say is I noticed that depending on the time of the day, you find less. So if you're fishing at noon, you're not gonna see very many fish species, um, but it seemed kind of like, um, it varied from month to month, um, what you got, but if you were, Fishing in the morning, you got kind of the similar stuff. Um, I never tracked it based on the, I mean, I'd have to go back and look at the dates and see what the moon process, where the moon was or, um, but it seemed like, uh, you know what, I'm gonna leave that unanswered because I don't wanna say without looking at it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. <That's very> <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Cassie. Thank you. Audience, you're doing a great job. Did you know that when you clap loudly for the speakers, that it makes them give better talks? <laughs> so let's remember that as we um, continue. You're doing a great job. Um, we're going to bring up our next speaker. Her name is Sadicha Shreshta. And her talk is titled Natural Disasters and Real Estate Prices in Hawaii. Give it up for Sadicha. Aloha, everybody. Um, I'm Sadicha Shrestha, and I'm an economics PhD student at UH Manoa. Uh, so today I'll be talking about natural disasters and real estate prices in Hawaii. Um, so the principal investigator for this project is Professor Peter Poleki, and the co-principal uh, investigators are Professor Nori Tarui and Professor uh, McKenna Kaufman. So just to give you a brief background on why this matters, uh, first of all, it's important to know that the real estate and rental and leasing industry accounts for a significant uh, proportion of Hawaii's GDP. In particular, in 2022, it accounted for about 18% of the state's GDP. Uh, at the same time, we're aware that Hawaii is highly vulnerable to natural disasters such as hurricanes, tsunamis, uh, floods, and other coastal disasters. And in light of uh, the global climate change, uh, we've witnessed an increase in the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events and natural disasters. So it's kind of important to look at how uh, these events affect um, the real estate prices in Hawaii. And that's what we do in the study. So. Um, we are 
focusing on the time period 1994 to 2021, and we're using three different data sources. So the first data source is from Black Knight. It's a proprietary data. It's the property level transaction data, which has information on the sales price of real estates. Um, it has information on uh, the real estate uh, characteristics, and it also has information on the parcel ID, which allows us to get the exact uh, census tract in which these real estates are located, uh, the exact flood zones in which real estate properties are located, and then we have other uh, real estate properties such as uh, the number of rooms, um, the lot sizes, uh, the number of bathrooms, and um, all those information which you would basically try to acquire before you purchase a real estate property. And then we use two different uh, pub, two data sources from FEMA, also known as Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, these are the disaster databases. So the first one is a public data on redacted claims. So this just includes information on the amount of claims that were paid by FEMA um, following a natural disaster. And then we use uh, the Presidential De Disaster Declaration Summaries data. So this includes uh, information on all the presidential declared disasters for the state of Hawaii. It includes information on the start date and the end date and the counties that are affected by uh, those particular presidential declared disasters. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about the method. Um, I'm not going to delve into the technical details, but um, in economics, we have different methods of um, different methods to identify the causal impact of, um, of, for instance, in this case, the natural disaster, right? So uh, we use a method called difference and difference, um, which I'm not going to explain the technical details, but in simple and plain words, what we're trying to do is so we have something called the treatment unit. So in our study, the treatment unit would be the census tract level. So whatever analysis we do in our study, everything uh, that analysis is done at the census tract level. So which means that we are comparing homes or properties that are located in census tracts that are exposed to presidential declared disasters uh, to homes that are located in census tracts that have never been exposed to any disasters. So we have the treatment units and then we have the control units. So the control units would be the latter one, uh, the uh, homes located in census tracts that have never been exposed to any disasters. And we also control for other variables that could potentially affect the real estate prices because you know natural disasters solely do not determine the home prices. Uh, there could be uh, other factors that home buyers look take into account, for example, the lot sizes or uh, the flood zones or even distance to the nearest coastline. So, yeah, so this method uh, basically gives us the causal impact or effect of natural disasters on real estate prices. Um, so yeah, just to give you, um, just to show you a little, uh, some graphs and figures. So uh, this is the uh, figure that shows the trend of average yearly real estate prices in Hawaii. So as we can see, there is an increasing trend in um, the whole, the real estate prices in Hawaii. So there was a peak in um, uh, 2008, and then after which, you know, financial crisis and the home prices collapsed. So overall, we see an increasing trend in real estate prices in Hawaii. Um, so this is just to give you an overview of the timeline of presidentially declared disasters. So I think I forgot to mention, but uh, in our during our study period, we have 16 different presidential declared disasters. And out of those 16, we have about 10 severe storms, um, three floods, two hurricanes, one tsunami, and one landslide. So uh, in this figure, uh, we're just trying to plot the uh, amount of claims paid by FEMA um, after these disasters. So for example, um, as we can see the one on the right, uh, so these are in USD, these are in million dollars. So uh, as we can see that the flood from 2018, after, flood from after the flood that occurred in 2018, uh, the amount of claims that were paid that was paid by FEMA was almost 29 million US dollars. And then the amount of claims paid by uh, FEMA after the tsunami in 2011 on the top, it was about 11%. Um, so yeah, so these are like, you know, like really huge disasters, as you can tell by the amount of claims paid by FEMA. So this is just to give you an idea on what kind of disasters we are including in our study. Um, so yeah, these have to be the two biggest ones in our study in our sample, during our sample period. Um, so this is just to show you um, the locations in the map, the census tracts uh, uh, to which FEMA paid the claims. 
after disasters. So uh, there's like some mis missing, as you can see, like, you know, for the big island, there's like a missing chunk. So this this map only shows those census tracts for which claims were for which claims were paid by FEMA. So the darker the the shade of blue, uh, the more the claims paid by FEMA. So as we can see, for the topmost island, I believe that's um, that's Kauai. Um, so we can see that you know in that particular region, it's 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 kind of dark, right? So I believe that has to do with like the the flood from 2018. So the claims paid are like kind of high for that region. And then also for Oahu, it's there's like one small portion like in the towards the end, which is kind of dark. So yeah, I'm not sure which disaster uh, that is, but yeah, that census tract received a, a huge amount of claims following, following a natural disaster. So yeah, so. Um, okay, so let's talk about the effect of natural disasters on the real estate prices. Um, so in this graph, uh, the first thing I want to explain is that, okay, so you have the blue horizontal, sorry, the blue vertical line. So the blue vertical line basically uh, tells us that a disaster has occurred. And then you have uh, four different units. So you have, uh, so which denote the time period after the disaster. So time period one consists of six months after the disaster. Time period two means you're considering seven to 12 months after a disaster, time period three means you're considering um, 13 to 18 months after a disaster, and time period four means you're considering 19 to 24 months after a disaster. So essentially you're looking at two years before the natural, before a natural disaster and two years after a natural disaster. And you have the red horizontal, um, the red horizontal zero level line. So uh, remember how at the beginning I said like we are comparing uh, the treatment units and the control units. So our treatment units are all those properties that are located in census tracts um, that have been exposed to a natural disaster, whereas the control units are those properties that are located in census tracts that have never been exposed to any disaster. So, um, you know, in order to do a causal analysis, our treatment units and control units need to be at need to be behaving in a similar manner before the disaster occurred, right? So on the left, on the left, as you can see, all the vertical bars, they actually touch the red line. So what that means is that um, before the disaster, the treatment units and the control units were behaving in a similar manner. So now this tells us that after the disaster, as you can see, none of the vertical bars are actually touching the red line. So as we can see, there's a decline in the home prices. So um, if you look at the first time period, we can see that there's a decline of about, about 6% uh, in home prices following a disaster in the first time period. And then in the second time period, um, it's a little lower. So it's about, it's, it's about like 5.2% 5 5 maybe. So you can see the decline is you know, sharp for like the first, first six months. And then it gets a little better as time passes by. So this, this graph is for all the homes in our, in our database. And to check for robustness, we also look at um, those homes that have been repeated, uh, those homes that have been sold more than once, also known as the repeated home sample. So we can see that, again, before the disaster, um, you know, all these graphs are actually touching the horizontal line, which means that the homes, the treatment homes versus the control homes, they were behaving in a similar manner. And once a disaster hits, uh, there is a significant decline in home prices uh, within the first six months. And again, within the seven to 12 months, uh, within the 13 to 18 months, and within and also in the 19 to 24 month period. Okay, so um, so we also do additional robustness checks uh, because we want to make sure that our results are actually not driven by uh, price outliers because you know um, some homes are like super like some homes in our in our sample were like really really expensive like they were like really really high and some home like some home prices were very low uh, maybe you know they bought their they bought those homes from their families or relatives for which, uh, due to which they were able to buy those at like a cheaper price. So we wanna make sure that our results are actually not driven by uh, those price outliers for which we also exclude the top 5% uh, 
home uh, homes with like top five percent of prices and uh, the lowest five percent home prices, and we find similar results. So we can see that uh, again after a disaster hits, there's a decline in home prices uh, within the first time within the first time period, which is uh, six months, and then again the second time period, seven to twelve month period. Uh, falling up all the way to two year period after the disaster. Uh, one last uh, robustness check that we do is we also remove the lot size outliers because you know, some of the homes might have like large or like big lot sizes whereas some homes might have uh, small lot sizes. So to make sure that those are also not driven by the um, lot size outliers, we also remove those and we see there's that there is still a significant decline in home prices, uh, even for this particular sample. So yeah, this is uh, these are all the preliminary results we have, and these are obviously uh, subject to change. Uh, so I think that our preliminary results might be of interest to uh, policymakers. And one key uh, implication I can think of right now is uh, that you know lower house prices uh, leads to lower housing wealth. And previous studies have shown that um, housing wealth and consumption activities have a positive relationship, which means that if you know um, housing housing wealth is lower, then your then consumption activity is also lower. And lower consumption means you know uh, it's going to have like lower economic activity, and then ultimately it's going to affect the GDP and also the economic growth of the country. So um, yeah, so this is all I have. Uh, these are preliminary results subject to change, but yeah, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, hey, questions for Salicha. I'll get us started. Um, you showed us the results from the FEMA claims. Mm -hmm. Was there um, anything surprising to you with what you found there? Um, are you relating them back to natural disasters from specific points in time? Yeah, can you tell us more about the data that you collected on the FEMA claims? Um, so actually, I did not collect that. That's a publicly available data. So I actually uh, merged the two data. So first of all, we have the data on claims, right? So we have information on how, many, how much claims was paid uh, to each census tract by FEMA following a disaster. And then with, for the presidential declared disaster, we have information on which counties were affected by those particular presidential declared disasters. So somehow I was able to like merge those databases. So once I have that, like now I'm able to merge that with the housing data I have so that I have information on which like homes, you know, like because homes have, there's information on like uh, homes are located in which census tract. So that way I have information now on which uh, homes are located in those census tracts that are affected by presidential declared disasters. Great. Yeah. Okay, other questions for Sadicha? Oh, here we go. Let's hear first from, um, I saw George's hand go up and then we'll work our way backwards. One, two, three. I was just wondering, what, what would uh, your study have to uh, the uh, Maui uh, disaster part and you know, kind of, and please don't the question. You know, kind of, yeah. you know, what, what would we use to study to say to see people who set, set up the whatever they, um, it's a, you know, I, I went to Maui, but the thing is, uh, it, there's so much activity going on, but it doesn't seem to be coordinated with what to do. So you know when when you when you uh, when you look at your area study, uh, what areas would you would they uh, you say that the the Maui fireworks would uh, you know. um let me try and sum up the question yeah. a little okay so um the question for the online audience I'm gonna sum it up is Sadisha, do you have any advice for homeowners on Maui, especially those that experience the wildfire in Lahaina, based off of some of the preliminary results from your study? Especially, they, 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 they got, it, uh, all, the, uh, all the structures are burned in that area, right? You don't have a, you know, a party, uh, okay, or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so, That's a good point. Yeah. And the, the add-on comment is, especially in consideration 
that this particular natural natural disaster uh, leveled homes all the way to the ground. Um, so uh, first of all, I think I'm sorry. I apologize. I think I did not uh, make it clear that we have not included wildfires in our analysis. So we're only looking at what looking at water related disasters, which were uh, floods, hurricanes, tsunamis, and there was a landslide, uh, severe storms. And the second question, do you mind repeating it? I uh, I think that's a good answer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mahalo for your question, George. Good question. I liked it. Let's um take Leon's question second. And actually, Leon, do you want to come up here and then I don't have to repeat your question? <laughs> oh, the mic. Okay. And then I'll just stand next to you and I'll hold it like this. Okay. Um, I had a question about, um, so in terms of like longer term change, looking at sea level rise and kind of climate change impacts, is some of that factored into this as well? Maybe just talk a bit about how long term change maybe is already priced into some of the real estate market. It, maybe it's not directly related to your study, but how does climate change factor in to, to some of these decisions that you're looking at? Okay. And then I guess my second question real quick is this line here, like when do you get back to to break even? Is there a point where it gets back to break even in price and it starts going up again? Um, okay, thank you for your question. Um, so first of all, uh, in this study, we uh, we do not take into account like other climate factors. So I was just solely focusing on natural disasters. So I do not take into account other uh, other climate uh, other climate variables. Uh, and the second part, I think that's a good idea. I've been wanting to do that, and I haven't done that for now. Uh, we're only focused. We only did like two years before. We only looked at two years before and two years after. But I should probably, uh, you know, like add more time periods and see like when the effect actually when the home prices actually go back to the normal. Yeah, that's something I have to do, which I haven't done as of now. Okay, let's take the third question. You get options. You can come and say your question on the microphone, or you can say your question, and then I will summarize. I just noticed one more thing. If you go back to your curve, like the minus one period and minus two period were showing a bit of an anomaly in the gap versus the trend. Is there a reason for that? Okay, so the question is the minus one and the minus two period were showing an anomaly on the trend. What is the reason? Sadisha's looking at it. Uh, I don't remember what the anomaly was actually. Do you remember like which time period? Just this sort of trend point of view, right? So like before the disaster, you see some sort of trend that gets uh, parallel to the baseline or it's going down, but I noticed like at minus one, minus one, like uh, you'll see some spikes up or down. You know, after the disaster, everything went down, mm -hmm. but like, on the minus one, I noticed some anomalies. Like, did you observe? Like, or do you know the reason? Um, that's a good question. I, yeah, I cannot answer that right now because I don't. I'm not sure about that. But I should look into that. Thank you. Okay, looks like you got a research collaborator in the room. How exciting! Future research to do together. And now the another round of applause for Sadisha. Thank you so much for the talk. We have come to the point where we're gonna do the raffle. So if you have a raffle ticket, please pull it out. And then drum roll, please. Drum roll. And the winning number was six, four, eight. See Richard. You can come visit us when the talks. Okay, congrats to you. Um, yes, thank you, Beth. We asked the graduate students if they wanted intro music for their talks. Our next speaker took us up on that offer. Let's bring up Capono Gallon. <laughs> Amped up, everybody. <laughs> Got to learn about a whole new genre of music today, too. That's a, uh, what is it? Child death metal? There you go. 
So aloha everybody, my name is Kapono Gowan. Today I'm gonna to be talking about using social culture indicators to uh, understand how management affects those who use the environment. Set the stage a little bit for natural resource management, we're largely talking about humans addressing issues that are caused by human activities. And these issues are typically focused on biological and environmental factors. And the typical solution to those factors are most often to regulate some sort of human activity. And then the effectiveness of those regulations are then measured in biological and environmental factors. Well, the impact on place-based communities are largely left up to assumptions. So if we can take a hypothetical managerial view here, we have a problem. Maybe we have low, co <clears throat> low coral cover or lower fish biomass than we used to have. And our solution in this hypothetical might be to limit some sort of access or activity. And then we'll measure our success by did that coral cover or fish biomass go up or down. What we're leaving unaddressed though is these community and environmental relationships, which are a lot higher, harder to measure and understand. Are these people using this as an area to gather with their family, feeding themselves? Questions that really are a lot less obvious to measure and understand across time. So in our project, we wanted to try to use something called social cultural principles and indicators to provide a metric and an understanding of those kind of relationships. Social cultural principle is distilled down as basically a fundamental value or goal that a community wishes to perpetuate or enhance through management activity. And an indicator is a measurable factor that you can use to describe the state of a principle. So putting that back into our hypothetical here, if I have a management solution, I want to know what is the community impact of this. I can ask the community ahead of time, okay, what are the most important factors about your relationship with this area? In this hypothetical, maybe it's a place of gathering and subsistence harvest is important. And then you can ask the same community, member, okay, how would you maybe measure these things? Where indicate to you that these areas are optimal places of gathering or providing a adequate amount of subsistence harvest. And maybe you'll learn things like, oh, the presence of tourist groups actually lowers our ability to gather and use this area how we want to. Or maybe the number of subsistence fishers is an indicator of how useful or not the area is for subsistence harvest. And then you can plug that back into our manager review where our problem is not just simply low coral cover or fish biomass, but also is it still a place of gathering? Are people being able to use it for the ways that they want to? And then we can ask a little bit more nuanced questions about our solutions, access to who and by what, and then measure the success also in those coral cover and biomass and in our indicators reflecting those principles. Which brings us to Hawaii's Division of Aquatic Resources. They have statewide rules. This is the regulatory body for Hawaii's near shore area. They regulate according to statewide rules, which apply anywhere and everywhere in their jurisdiction. And they also have place specific rules, which are regulations set to a specific place in the form of a marine management area, basically rules above and beyond the typical rules throughout the state. And at the beginning of this project, Dar wanted to understand how the community is being affected by these place specific management, these marine management areas. So the project broken down into two stages. I entered in the second stage here. So the first stage was a cooperative development where the indicators and principles were developed. And the second stage was this field test where we wanted to see, okay, how can these be used? How are they effective? And how can we implement them in a way that would actually work for the community and for DAR? So in that cooperative development stage was primarily done through structured workshops, which a number of community members with strong ties to the environment were gathered in meetings and asked for essentially knowledge and perspective on what is most important with your relationship to the environment. Those meeting transcripts were taken along with the notes from the meetings and coded, and then draft principles and indicators were created from that, which is then brought back to the community who provided feedback on, well, are these accurately capturing? What is our important principles? And are these indicators reflecting those? The result of that stage of the work was nine social cultural principles, each being measured between six to 14 indicators each. So an example of one of those principles, a near short area provides a place to practice and strengthen mental, physical, and spiritual well-being, an indicator of which would be near short areas positively contribute to mental, spiritual health, and the perception of safety in the near short area. 
Stage two is where I began working on this project, which was the cooperative implementation of these indicators and principles. Uh, the primary method we were using was cooperative and iterative field testing. Actually, Anita, somewhere in the back here too, helped immensely with this, the co-helper on this. And we were focusing really on the utility of these indicators. How can we collect data? And are there additional types of data that we need to understand the indicators or place-based context we need to understand what it's actually telling us? To that end, we partnered with Malamu Kubuke and Waiman and the Evalimu Management Hui, who are both associated with one of those marine management areas. And at the start of this process, we had uh, somewhere above 75 indicators, which was quite a lot to expect community partners and management to effectively use the entire suite of. So we wanted to lower that number, but not drift away from the intention that the community provided when they actually set these out. Speaking to the core, that the continued cooperation with community is key if this is gonna be implemented in a correct fashion. And then we wanted to refine the indicators that we had after that reduction. We wanted to really look at the utility, the ability to inform on the principle. Is it actually telling us something valuable that we can use to interpret the state of the principle or not? And then that place-based context. So when I'm talking about the utility, again, it's the ability to actually tell us something meaningful. One of the principles in this example is to ensure appropriate access and to sustain quality of the nearshore experience, which could be indicated by the number of illegal activities or citations which when you think about it, means a lot of things. It could be number of parking tickets, it could be number of drug busts or number of fishing infractions, right? It's a large swath. Just the number of citations, probably not gonna tell you all that much about the principal. So we refined that one to the number of doe care, the enforcement arm of DAR violations, really reflecting back on management implications, how the area is being managed and the effectiveness of that management. And for those place-based contexts, an example here, the principle is to maintain and enhance local access to the quality and experience in the nearshore area indicated by the presence of facilities that support access, things like restroom paved roads or parking lots. But really, does more access always improve the state of quality for the people that use that area? On the left here, we have Waikiki. On the right, YPO Valley, if you ask the community members here, they're probably gonna have entirely different aspects on whether they want more roads, more bathrooms, things like that. Really speaking to the need to go back to the actual area these are being implemented in and gathering the context ahead of time to understand what these indicators are telling you. And that final stage, that data collection, how can this be collected and who's expected to go out there and actually get the data? There's a whole lot I could have talked about here um, but I wanted to wrap back around to last year's, if anybody was here about that, and talk about the header of this project, which was uh, social media use. So one question in this whole swath of data collection is, could we collect some of this data with the use of social media? I have a small YouTube channel where, called Shock of Fishing, um, and the community members in here are really proactive and want to engage, right? And the beginning of this project, I want to roll, there's a very tight group of community members here, is social media a possible way to reach concentrated areas that would be very hard to reach out in the environment? I could A, go out and stand at a boat ramp and try to talk to fishermen all day, or B, reach out to where they're concentrated on lines. So to test that, we wanted to see if influencer marketing could be used to connect with specific stakeholder groups, uh, quickly make everybody a professional on social media marketing, an influencer is simply a content creator, someone that creates and posts online content that is assumed to have some level of influence with the community that engages with their content. Influencer marketing is a specific marketing method to reach a specific audience through those influencers. So if you post content online and build a community around that content and spend time with them, you can be assumed to have some level of influence with the people you engage with and be called an influencer. So in this segment of the project, we contracted five fishing influencers. Those are people that make some sort of content about fishing in Hawaii and had them to attempt to try to connect DAR with those who fish in Hawaii. Key findings out of this, I pulled just the one relevant one today. The core assumption that we have there seems to be true. The stakeholders will be organized around the influencers that are similar to their defining characteristics. In this project, 
one of the surveys we put out through the influencers ended up getting about 3,300 survey completions, which if you ever had any engagement with a government survey is pretty crazy. They're like, okay, what, it's either the best survey ever or something weird is going on here. Turned out something weird was going on. <laughs> we had a, again, five influencers put this out, um, got a pretty good feedback from them. And then, okay, so I would go to sleep and I check in on Monday and okay, it went from like 50 to 100, which I'm stoked about, to 3,000, something, oh, what the heck happened over the weekend? Turns out that a number of non-sponsored influencers decided to unilaterally take those links and provide them through their own social media outlets for essentially advocacy reasons. And it blew it up. Um, but luckily, because I incorporated a couple of questions in that survey, I could identify where these influencers were, find, track down the content, and then group them according to the kind of content they were making. After doing that grouping, I could then compare how effective were these groups at reaching our target demographic, those fishermen in Hawaii, fishermen and women in Hawaii. We found that the fishing influencers were actually 118 times more effective at reaching the people we were trying to reach than off topic, in this case, shark influencers, because it was majority of shark diving and advocacy group kind of things, which is huge. That's, yeah, so that seems to support that idea that if you want to reach certain demographics, they might already be organized online, and there's probably people out there with a direct line to communicate with them. Ongoing work, indicators are cut down to about 18 now. So we got to bring the question forward. Did we lose the richness and the intent by doing that? Did we get this ahi that we promised the community and a shark came and bang, now we got this kind of, uh, yeah, it's still ahi. <laughs> um, which at this end of things, the workshop participants could vet our reduced indicators and principles and really give some feedback on that. Field testing within methods and community partners, we ran through this uh, STEM two reports, one from Anita and I, and really we were wondering, are the approaches we're using to collect this data gonna be viable, right? Because someone's gotta go out there and get the data. And is that gonna make it useful or not? And is it possible for staff members to feasibly go out to all these places and do that on a reoccurring basis? That's all I have to say today. Thank you, everybody. Some citations. If you want to read about this, um, link to my website. Reports are up and live now. The social media one's up. The DAR one's coming up soon. And we have one publication that should be published, uh, hopefully, in the next week here. Questions for Copono. I'll get us started. My question is, um, I should have thought a question before I walked up here. <laughs> My question is, um, tell us more about the how you're going to figure out which data is easy to collect and who should collect what data. What kinds of things are you going to look at? For that end of things, we kind of went out there and brute force tried out some methods for that. One method was survey distributions, basically asking the people to fill out a survey relevant to these questions. The other one was a visual inspection. If you could count certain things, kind of reflecting that biological and environmental thing. There are things we can count out here that reflect these principles and tell us something. Short story is it doesn't work perfectly either way. And the survey end of things, we ended up getting, I think it was 80% tourist feedback. Arguably, probably not the people that know the most about those specific relationships we're investigating. Um, so difficult to go out and expect staff members to go give surveys or your community partners to give surveys and to get enough data through that form. And then the visual surveys, also very difficult to go out there and count things and reflect that in a purely accurate way. So where it goes now, that's gonna be up to the next person that got hired. I hope they, <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, the idea is sound. Really, this is something important that needs to be addressed in the management world. DAR is kind of heading the whole thing of like, no one's really done this in this kind of way. So it's a lot of learning and figuring out how can we roll this out in an effective manner. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for Kapono? Leon, do you want to come in and ask your question on the mic? No, you want to sit there. Okay. 
government organization like that's changing the social media influence, but maybe talk a bit more about what you're trying to do. Yeah, the that's a dang good question. Um it's can an un oh questions? the question was what kind of advice can I give to government agencies seeking to engage with influencers in this social media kind of realm? It's an uncomfortable place for many government agencies to relinquish control of how things are being communicated. Um, they want to communicate it in a very specific way. And if it's not that way, it becomes uncomfortable for managers on different levels. So really being comfortable with letting your communi community speak about whatever it is, however they truly feel about it. I think that kind of reflects why oftentimes government outreach isn't too effective. If you're going to frame it in a certain way, there's a certain aspect of the community that's probably not going to vibe with that framing and you're going to miss out on them engaging. So being open to allowing someone to voice it however they best, they're the best communicators with their audience. They already know how to communicate with them. Um, and even if it's not how you would necessarily want to communicate, being open to criticism in that aspect. It actually turned out one of the communicators did that in a negative and positive fashion. They were the most effective at it, bringing people in to actually have meaningful conversations down the line, which reflects the marketing material. If you're selling products through influencer marketing, it's a lot more effective if you let them communicate positive and add negative aspects of your product. Okay. Thank you. Big round of applause for Kapal. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.